to understand. He was betrayed by a friend, arrested and falsely sentenced to death. Jesus could have avoided the cross, called down fire from heaven, or summoned legions of angels to rescue him, to save him. But Jesus was not interested in saving himself. He was all about saving you. Every detail of this torturous path to the cross was part of God's plan to bring you to him. We're all broken. We've all messed up and have all made wrong choices. And no one had to teach us as a baby about anger and selfishness. We just came out that way, sort of a sin covering. But on the cross, with his blood he shed, the Bible says Jesus blotted out our record of sin, nailing it to his cross. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin covering. And his blood is our ticket. Our ticket to enter through a new door, a forever relationship door with God. So what do we do with this great news? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it's not enough to believe in Jesus with just your head. You must believe with your heart. Now. There's just one person alone at the foot of the cross. It is you. What will you say to Jesus? Say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I'm giving you my heart today, Jesus. I do believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead for me. Please give me a new heart and a new life right now. All right, in this video, I want to talk about righteousness and imputed righteousness. Now, this picture here says it all. A picture is worth a thousand words here. Right here is the sinner. The sinner basically is exchanging righteousness with God. Our righteousness is filthy rags. It's full of sin. We give it over to God, and God, being the perfect, innocent lamb that he is, gives us his righteousness in exchange. Right here is a marriage between the believer and God. Right here, where there's becoming one flesh. And that's why God is able to take upon our sins and give us his righteousness. Well, we can read in the Old Testament about how the father, if the, the daughter isn't married, or the husband, if the daughter is married, can actually cover for the wife when she sins, when she does something wrong. He can actually cover for it, and she won't receive any blame. But he can also let her deal with the consequences and this is what's going on here god the father is taking care of his daughters god the son is taking care of his bride he's taken upon our sin and giving us his righteousness we're being covered by our father's righteousness by our husband's righteousness right here this is what's going on here so, with that being said, I've already established what's going on. I'm going to show you this through the scriptures. And actually start over here because of what I just said. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about being confident in the flesh. Verses 2 through 6 right here. And he says that he could boast in the flesh more than anybody else and he even says that touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless here at verse six right here touching the righteousness which is in the law he's blameless so you see that he wasn't sinless but he 
offered up sacrifice for his sins. That's why he is blameless. He would be considered righteousness, righteous according to the letter of the law. But he even says right here that he was persecuting the church. So he was making it rough for them, imprisoning them, maybe even condoning to torture, and he obviously condoned to their murder, such as with Stephen. And inspired by the Holy Spirit here, touching the righteousness which is in the law, he's blameless. Right? That's his righteousness. But he says that he counts it all but dung. And at verse 9 he says, Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So we see here that Paul made the exchange that we see right here. He had his own righteousness by the law, but he gave it all up. He gave up the flesh, gave it to Jesus, and Jesus imputed his righteousness to him. That's what is going on right here. Verses 2 through 9 here in Philippians chapter 3. Paul has his own righteousness. He counts it but dung and he gives it over to God and he receives God's righteousness in exchange. Right? So, now what I like to do is go to the beginning. Let's get into Genesis and the Old Testament and show that God is our righteousness. Here, in Genesis chapter 15, God is telling Abraham that though he doesn't have any children, his seed will be as numerous as the stars are in the heavens. And at verse 6, it talks about Abraham and it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So we see here that Abraham isn't righteous because he keeps the law perfectly, that he's blameless according to the law, that he established his own righteousness. No, it was counted righteous to him because he believed in the Lord. And that's the capital L-O-R-D, which is yod heh vav -Hey, which means behold the hand, behold the nail. And Jesus means Yahweh, our salvation. Behold the hand, behold the nail, our salvation. So he believed in the Lord, yod heh vav -Hey. It's telling you a lot just in that name, what he believed in. Right? So there's our first instance of imputed righteousness. Isaiah has a few passages about it. Isaiah 46, verse 12, it says, Hearken unto me, you ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So here Isaiah is prophesying of God's righteousness and it being salvation. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. And a lot of Christians have not come to this realization. They don't even know the gospel, yet alone believe it or believe it in their heart. So they've never been born again. They've never been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. They believe that they need to help save themselves and that they have to earn it, they have to deserve it, they have to establish their own righteousness. And they'll bring up somebody like Job or John the Baptist's parents, how they were considered blameless and righteous by the law. But that doesn't mean they're sinless. Just like Paul wasn't sinless when he's considered blameless according to the law, they still offered up their sacrifices. Right? But they try to use that as some kind of reasoning to say that 
you can be perfect and keep the law. And that's what they tell themselves, even though they haven't done it. I One time I talked to this uh, Seventh-day Adventist who was uh, 90 years old. And he's still cognitive. I talked to this guy for a good six months or so, off and on. And he talked about having to actually overcome sin and stop sinning. And I said, well, how long have you been a Christian? He says, well, since I was about 12 years old, it's been about over 80 years. And I was like, well, have you stopped sinning? And he, he couldn't say he did. And I was like, so you've been on this walk for 80 years, knowing that you have to overcome sin and stop sinning, but you haven't done it over 80 years. How is that not letting you know you've been having an 80-year witness that you cannot bring the flesh into subjection to the law and establish your own righteousness? Your, your righteousness, if it were robes, would just be tattered robes. Little patches. It'd be embarrassing to bring that forth and to reveal it for what it is. If that's what you're going to bring to God, 80 years of failure, when he says to be perfect and holy as he is, you're going to be condemned. And this, uh, this man ended up, I don't know if he ended up just leaving the groups I was part of or if he just blocked me, uh, one or the other. And, uh, Hopefully the seeds were planted, but, I mean, over 80 years, I'm pretty sure seeds have been planted. Hopefully they got watered. But, uh, that's a stubborn heart right there. A heart of stone that stubbornly is sticking to it like a Pharisee. Like, I'm going to be perfect. I am worthy of being saved. It's what I deal with with talking with Catholics a lot, is that they're like, no, you have to work for it. You have to earn it. And they got this pride about him as if they deserve heaven and eternal life. Because they're like, I've been doing these rituals my whole life. I've been doing what God wants. He's going to have to let me in. And they don't realize they're being Cain. Where Cain's like, well, I did what God said to my father Adam to till the ground by the sweat of my brow. I've done that and I produced the fruit. God has to accept me. But he didn't. And that's how it's going to be for a lot of Christians. Getting into some more of the of Isaiah and then a couple other passages from the Old Testament. In Isaiah 51, at verse 6, it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Isaiah 61, this one I really like, verse 10 here. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robes of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride ordain, ordaineth herself with her jewels. We see that this is a good reference to the church, the bride of Christ, clothed in the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. This is God's imputed righteousness. This is not our own. This is Jesus' clothes that we are covered with. If we accept the gospel by faith, we believe in our heart, confess with our mouths. Right? This is definitely one that I'm going to be saving off to the side here. I really like this one. Isaiah 45 and verse 24. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are 
increased against him shall be ashamed. So here we see, in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. All right, you don't have it within yourself. It's within the Lord because you get his righteousness. Psalms 89, 16. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. So you see here, in our own righteousness, we're not going to be exalted. But in God's righteousness, we'll be exalted. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And this is referring to the Messiah showing up. And it's bringing in the only everlasting righteousness is God's righteousness. So we're, we've been seeing prophesied from uh, all these passages in the Old Testament that I've been bringing up. And then we see this in the New Testament here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 30. But of him are we in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's what we need to be glorying in is how righteous Jesus Christ is and that we actually get credit for that because he has been made unto us righteousness. And again, I'm going to be referring to that, that we're clothed in that, the bride. The reason why we look so good is not because of ourselves, but because of Jesus's imputed righteousness. And before I continue, I should probably put a disclaimer because a lot of these people who don't believe the gospel and call themselves Christians lie about me. They'll lie about what I'm saying, even though they say not to sin and lying's a sin, they'll sit there and just lie about me, even when I tell them the exact opposite of what they're saying. I am not saying to do as thou wilt, and to live as you want, and just give in to the flesh. Not what I'm saying at all. Never said that. The Bible doesn't say that. If you truly love God and love your fellow man, why would you do that? If you love God and you love your fellow man, submit to God. And allow him to change you and mold you into the image and likeness of Jesus. That you be a light to the world, the salt of the earth, a pillar of truth holding forth the word of life. And that you may actually get the gospel out to people. You'll plant seeds, you'll water, you'll tear up weeds, pull up stones. You'll be a blessing to others. And the people you care about just may get saved because of your witness. And you'll represent God in a way that's pleasing to him. So do the right thing and come to God with all your, your issues, all your burdens. Because I know there's the sins that we all struggle with. And they, they seem to get the best of us. But we're not condemned. But we ought to overcome those and bring it to Jesus so that we can overcome them. And then we can actually be a help to others who are going through the same thing. And point them to Jesus as well. Now, these people who are saying the opposite of what I'm just saying right now, they're lying pieces of shit is what they are. They turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They're showing that the only reason why they're actually trying to obey God and to do good works is for themselves and to escape hell and to earn heaven. And if they didn't have to do those things to earn heaven, 
and to escape hell, they wouldn't do them. And that's why they lie about me, because their own sinful nature is coming up saying, well, then if I don't have to do these things to be saved, why am I going to do them? Yet these same people will preach about how the law is loving God and loving your fellow man. All about love, love, love. But as soon as they don't have to do this love thing to escape hell and to receive heaven, they throw it out the window. It shows their character and what's really going on with them. And even though they, they put up this big talk about keeping the law, they're obviously not doing it. Because they can't. They're just prideful. But anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God. So it's not our own righteousness. So when we take this and we see made the righteousness of God, and we're clothed in the robes of righteousness here, that there is nothing that we could ever think, say, or do, or not think, say, or do, that could actually taint, stain, ruin, destroy God's righteousness. It is, as it says here, the righteousness of God. That means there's nothing that you do that has an effect on that. Right? You can look at it like this. You have a very rich father. And even though you get a lot of speeding tickets and parking tickets, it doesn't matter because your dad is always going to pay them off. Right? Now, just because you speed, just because you, you park wherever you feel like and you... you I'm just going to use these little misdemeanor things where you run through the red light and go through the stop signs and stuff. You get all these tickets, but your dad pays them off. That doesn't ruin his righteousness, even though he can keep paying those off. What you're doing doesn't stain his righteousness at all. It still covers you. Right? But you would be a prick to take advantage of that. You'd be ungrateful and inconsiderate and, like I said, a straight-up piece of shit if that's what you did. Right? And I'm not preaching to do that. The Bible doesn't preach to do that. And to say that I am is a lie. So, continuing on with this, just got to put those disclaimers out there because... That's a lot of the responses I get from the people who disagree is they'll say things like, you're preaching, do as thou wilt. And it's like, no, that's what you're hearing because you're a selfish, carnal, sinful human being, just like we all are. But anyway, Romans chapter 5, verse 15, it says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I like all the times that it says free gift here. Free gift. That means you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it or deserve it. It's a free gift. And I like that it puts in free. Because a gift, it's, the, it's just that. If I gave you a gift, it's a gift. You don't have to earn it, deserve it, pay for it. But it puts the emphasis that it's free. So there's no misunderstanding here. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abound unto many. And we get this grace, the gift by grace. Grace is the opposite of works. You read that in Romans 11.6, that if it's by grace, then it's not of works. And if it's not by works, it's not of grace. Because grace is something you don't earn and you don't deserve. And works is something that you've earned and deserved, right? So it's like coming to a T-section in a road. You can either go left or right. You can't go both. 
So if you're going to go right and choose grace, then works aren't involved, or else you're not going right anymore. Right? Now, if you choose left and go works, well, then it's no more of grace because you're going left. You're, you're going with the works. You can't have both. You're going one way or the other. And if you choose both, then you're stuck there in the middle. You're not going anywhere. You're just stuck in place. Right? So it goes on to say at verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So you get a gift of righteousness. Your righteousness is a gift. Do you see that it's not something that you've earned and you deserved? Grace gift of righteousness. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's obedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Like three times it says free gift, and like five plus times it says that it's a gift. You keep thinking that you have to earn it and deserve it, and that you've got a pride to think that you've actually earned it and deserved it. You tell me, what is it you can do? What is it you can say, or not do and not say, that can make up for Beating, humiliating, and killing Jesus. What can make up for intentionally or accidentally killing somebody's son? What can make up for that? What can earn you forgiveness for that? Nothing. Yet, you are so prideful and arrogant, the good lot of you, to think that you can. You don't see how haughty and just arrogant you are. That, yeah, I beat, humiliated, and killed, killed Jesus with my sin, but I'm going to make up for it. Really. That's what you're going to do? That's why there's hell. And it's there for eternity. Because that's how long it's going to take to pay for such a thing. People not realizing what's going on here in the situation you're in. I talked about this gift. This is shortened right here in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see that? It's not of ourselves, not of works, or we would boast. It's making that clear. Right? Or it talks about it being a free gift. It's by grace, not of works. It's making it clear that it's by your faith alone, which is believing and trusting God. That's it. And I know there's a lot of jackasses who will say that it doesn't say alone there. Well, if it says faith, nothing else, and it excludes works, then what is with the faith? Nothing. It's alone. Right? That shouldn't have to be explained to you. But for some reason, it does. So anyway... To understand this, we can actually come up to the first verse or so of chapter 5. It says, therefore being justified by faith, right? We're not, that's believing and trusting God. We're not justified by repentance, water baptism, making amends, uh, stop sinning, going to confession, eating a wafer and drinking some wine, saying Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Keeping the seventh day Sabbath, 
uh, any of these things were justified by what faith? Does it say anything else? No. So it's faith alone. Boom. Whoa, mind-blowing, right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So he says here we have access to the grace by what? By faith. So when we read Ephesians and say, for by grace are you saved through faith, you have access to the grace by faith. Right? So uh, the reason why I point that out is because there's some people like the Calvinists, the Presbyterians there, the Puritans that say that the faith is a gift when it's not. The grace is the gift, as we've saw, seen right down here. Oops. The grace of grace, the gift of righteousness, the gift by grace. And it says you have access to the grace by faith. So when we read this, it's saying by you believing and trusting God that you receive the grace. It's not of works. It's a gift. But as Paul really emphasized in Romans 5, it's a free gift. Can't emphasize that enough. All these Christians are saying, you don't get a free ticket to heaven. Yes, you do. They don't like to say that. They think it, it, that that's some kind of argument-defeating, profound fact. You don't get a golden ticket. God's not holding out golden tickets for everybody to go to heaven. Yes, he is. Free golden tickets to heaven. That's Jesus Christ right there. He literally is giving you that free golden ticket to heaven. All you got to do is believe. The problem is, is that these people lack true belief. They don't truly understand the gospel. The first part of the gospel is realizing that you're a sinner. Not that you have sinned, or that you just sinned, but that you're a sinner, as in that's your nature, is to sin, like a liar. Liar doesn't mean that you're lying right there in the moment. It just means that you tend to lie, right? If somebody is like, known as a thief, it doesn't mean that he is has stolen or is stealing in the moment, but that he's a thief, so he will, will steal, right? Oh, this person is a cheater, an adulterer, adulteress. It doesn't mean that they're doing it in the moment or just done it in the past. It means that they have that reputation, and that's what they will do. And that's the thing with us being sinners, is that a lot of these people, because I've been in the same boat. I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You think that you're no longer a sinner because God has shown you the law, and you're going to keep it, and he's... You know, he's called you, he's chosen you to be righteous, keep the law. And that you're better than all the rest of the people who reject his law, and reject his Sabbath. You don't quite say that, but that's what's actually going on, is this, this pride and this arrogance coming up. And you don't admit that the truth, that you're a sinner just like everybody else. And then you start telling yourself, well, I'm better than them because I don't willfully sin. I try not to, and I work at this. It's like you just, again, it's the prideful arrogance. It's our flesh that cannot be subject to the law of God, yet you're trying to bring it into subjection to the law of God. And that's where you get the condemnation. As I believe some of the passages I'm going to bring up talk about how the law brings about sin because our very natures want to go against it now hear more about imputed righteousness romans chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 and well, we can even go all the way down to 8 here it says what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof the glory, but not before God. And that's where we see that Abraham could be, if he were justified by works, he could glory, but not before God. 
So that's where we can tie into James, because I know a lot of you who don't believe in the gospel will bring up James. Faith without works is dead, and can faith without works be saved, and yada, 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 right? But James is talking about being justified not before God, but before men. As we see here by works, he Abraham could glory, but not before God. Just like we read in Galatians that no one's justified by the law in the sight of God. So who are you justified in the sight of by your works and by the law? Your fellow man. That's why you would do well to be a good man or woman so that you don't ruin your witness to other people because they're going to judge you not by your faith in God or your professed faith in God, but by how you actually live. Right? He goes on to say in verse 3, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What well, we've read at the very beginning here in Genesis. Now to him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. There's that statement again about grace and works are opposite. If the reward is grace, then it's not of works. Because if it's by work, then it's not reckoned by grace, but by debt, because you're owed it, because you worked for it, you've earned it, you deserved it. Work, grace and works uh, don't mix. It's like left and right, black and white, if, if polar opposites, negative, positive. If you mix them together, they're no longer what they were. Like if you mix left and right together, it's something else. You mix black and white, you get the gray. You mix positive and negative, they cancel each other out. Right? They're no longer what they were. But continuing at verse 5, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, being God, Jesus Christ, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And again, this is one of those passages where the people will say, it doesn't say faith alone. It's saying, by your faith, believing and trusting God, without works, what is with the faith? Nothing. That's faith alone. Again, should not have to be told, but here we are having to explain this to people who are PhDs and doctorates and very well-educated people use that stupid argument. So it doesn't matter how educated you are, it doesn't mean that you're not a dumbass. But anyway, going to verse 7, it's saying, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Because you see, as soon as you believe the gospel and you are born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, your whole life is done. That's why I have this picture right here. Right? You've accepted the gospel. You're hiding behind that cross. And you see, when Jesus gave up his life on the cross, he didn't just die for the people who were alive right then and there. He died for all the people in the past. And he died for all of us who haven't even lived yet. Showing that Jesus took on all sin, past, present, and future. That God is not bound by time. And he took everything. So when he died on that cross, he was dying for Adam and Eve and what they did in the beginning. And he's dying for all the people that were putting him right there on the cross and mocking him and humiliating him. And he was dying for us who have done the things we're doing here at the end of the world. He took all of that upon him. So when you believe the gospel, your life is gone. That's why, even though you're still a sinner and you still sin, because there's nobody who's completely overcome sin entirely, we may have overcome different sins, like smoking cigarettes and alcohol and fornication and other such things, pornography and pot smoking and some of these ones that are little more blatant, but we haven't overcome it all. 
Nobody has. But thank God that we're not condemned because we're hiding behind the cross. When you believe the gospel, that's what happens. You're behind it. And you're covered. And it doesn't matter anything you've done, are doing, or will do. It's taken care of. And that's not a license to go do what you want. Because if that's what you actually hear and actually think and want to do, you're a piece of shit. You're an awful person. It's like somebody taking a bullet for you, pushing you out of the way of a car, and you just walk off. Like, oh yeah, whatever. You are a shitty person if that's how you are. Anyway, let's uh, continue on with this. Already brought this up, connecting to what we were just reading here about imputed righteousness from Romans chapter 4 over here. We see it imputed here, where, again, Paul gave up his righteousness, which is by the law blameless. He counts it but dung, he counts it shit, that he may have the righteousness of God. And we see this a lot in Romans. That's why I got a lot of Romans passages right here. Romans 9, verse 30, it says, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, right, by faith, by believing and trusting God? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness? Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stones. And that's what Peter talks about, how Jesus is a stumbling stone to the Jews, because they're like, we're going after the law. We're going after the righteous law. The law is righteous. We're going to follow it. Therefore, we're going to be righteous. And you're telling me that I need to have this faith and trust in Jesus to be righteous? It's a stumbling stone to them, just like it is to Seventh-day Adventists and the Catholics and a lot of these other denominations when you talk about grace. You talk, actually talk about the gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he lived a perfect life to impute to you so that you get credit for his life while he takes the punishment for yours. Right? That's the good news. That you no longer have to carry this burden of trying to force your flesh to keep the law and keep failing and being just burdened with that guilt and that shame and that fear of condemnation. The good news is that's gone now. You believe the gospel. You're born again. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Your soul is circumcised from the flesh. And though you still live in the flesh, there's a new you that can't be touched by the flesh. We read in Romans chapter 7, where Paul talks about, in the flesh dwells no good thing, and when the flesh gets him to do the things he doesn't want to do and keeps him from doing the things that he wants to do, it's the sin that's within the flesh. It's not him, it's the flesh. He even says it, that it's not him, but sin that dwells in him, in the flesh, because there's nothing good in the flesh. And says, who's going to save me from this body of death? Right? I don't know if I brought up Romans 7, but we'll see. Uh, Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God. Again, it's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. Without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The verse 22 is a real big one there, right? The righteousness of God, his righteousness, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. You believe, you receive God's righteousness. That's how you're saved. Not because of you. It's about how great God is, not how great you think you are and how you can be. You just having the same arrogance that Satan had is, where I can be like God. 
right? It's like uh, Matthew 19 with a rich man coming to Jesus saying, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do? What I do, you know? Because I can earn it because I'm that great. And Jesus tells him, only God is good. And this guy thinks that he is like God. Yeah, I've done the same thing from my, from my youth up. I've been perfect, keeping the law. He's like, oh, you've been perfect, have you? You see, the, the arrogance. I can be like God. I had that same arrogance. That's how I know it and I understand it and know what these people are going through is that I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, I messed up. I, I put Jesus on that cross, but you know what? I'm going to make up for that. I'm going to keep the law. I can be good like God. Did that for a good decade, roughly, about eight, ten years. Anyway, verse 23 here. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're not being justified by repentance and stop sinning. We're justified freely, again freely, by his grace, something is not earned or deserved through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. So we set forth the propitiation, which is the sacrifice, through faith in his blood. Believing and trusting in his shed blood there and his sacrifice declared his righteousness. That he might be the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And again, his righteousness, not ours. For some reason, people are really gung-ho about their own. Romans 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the men which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So we see here a contrast with the righteousness of the law and the righteousness which is by faith. And this is actually the same thing we actually see in Galatians. I'm not sure if this is what I have brought up. No, it's not. But I can actually look at it because I think it's actually in this uh, chapter here. Let me just go back to look real quick at here. Uh, the righteousness which is in the law. And at the beginning here, Paul talks about, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You've been so foolish that you begun in the spirit and made be perfect by the flesh. Now I'm sitting here ministering to you the, the, the spirit and worketh miracles among you. Do it. Do I do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And then he talks about being under the law is a curse because you have to do everything that is in the law. But the just shall live by faith. The law is not a faith. Right? So anyway, continuing on here in Romans chapter 1 at verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is basically what I've been preaching through this whole video, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So you see here, this is the gospel, the good news unto salvation to everyone that believes. Because the just will live by faith. So it's not about your works, your sinlessness. It's about God's righteousness 
in you believing and trusting God and how great God is and how worthless you are. That's why you need to come to God with humility and as a child. What can a child do to protect and save themselves? They trust in their father completely and totally. That's what we need to do. Right? This is another one that I want to save over here. Just going to meditate on those ones later. And I wanted to bring up these last passages because I know there's a lot of people who want to be under the law. It says here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So it's saying, why serve the law? It's not saying don't keep the law and go sin. It's saying, why are you making the law your righteousness and being trying to be justified by the law when nobody is justified and made righteous by the law? It was there till the seed should come. Talking about Jesus. And then it says here at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So we see a connection with life and righteousness here. It's saying that righteousness is not by the law. Very next verse, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe, not them that perfectly obey and are sinless. As it says in verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So we see here the law was to teach us two important things. The first one was to humble us to realize that we're sinners and that we can't keep the law. We can't be righteous like God. We constantly need to be offering up sacrifices because we are worthless sinners. And we can't save ourselves. The second is to show you the righteousness of God. And that he alone is righteous. And that you need to have faith in him to save you from the condemnation of the law. So the law is there for the two reasons. To humble you and to exalt God. Not to elevate you to the level of God and to bring God down to your level. Which is what a lot of Christians seem to want to be doing. Uh, Romans 7. This is good that I have Romans 7 up here. I can show you exactly what Paul was talking about earlier. But here in Romans 7 at verse 9 it says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And here is where somebody like an Adventist would twist this to be like, See, the law is holy, just, and good. You need to keep it and keep it perfectly. It's like no one's condemning the law and saying that it's not holy, just, and good. Matter of fact, when you admit that you're a sinner and that it condemns you, you're establishing the law by admitting that it is what it is, holy, just, and good, and that you are not. The problem is, is that these people look at the law and they think, I'm not bad, I can do this, I am doing this, when they're not. Even after Jesus magnified the law to show that the sin starts with your heart, where you might bite your tongue and you might not do something. But in your heart, you want to. And the seed is already there for you to say the things and to do the things because it's in your heart. We talked about, hey, you might not be committing fornication and adultery, but you have that lust in your heart when you look at others. That's where it starts. 
oh, you're not a murderer, but you have this hate in your heart towards your brother for no reason. There's the seed of it. And he's really showing it, magnifying the law, yet they still think that they can be perfect, holy, and just. They don't see that they just lie to themselves while they, while they lie to you. Right? And that's where he talks about the law and the flesh and how, like, I'm not going to get into the poetry of this where he's talking about he does the things that he doesn't want to do and he doesn't do the things that he wants to do. Why? Because of the flesh. But he says here, verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So he's saying it's not even him, right? And then he says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And at verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And that's where we get the context for this next chapter here, where he says, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we see what he's talking about here, about walking after the flesh, is walking after sight, not by faith. As he talks about, I've already brought up in Philippians, he can boast the flesh by boasting in his righteousness by the law. We see in Galatians that, are you made perfect by the flesh, has to do with you trying to keep the law. So if you're going to try to keep the law, you're walking in the flesh, and that's why there's condemnation. Because at verse 7 he says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And for some reason, these people have deluded themselves to think that even though they're in the flesh and they have a carnal mind, that they're not in the flesh and don't have a carnal mind. It's weird how they've actually deluded themselves into thinking that they don't have the flesh, that they don't have a carnal mind, and that they can actually please God by keeping the law, but it's constantly there condemning them. And I know this because, like I said, an Adventist for about a decade there, and I had that law condemning me that whole time, and it got to the point where I was praying to God saying, uh, I talked to some grace people. I never believed in it because I thought they were preaching grace to entice me to sin. I had the same mindset that I'm talking about here. That's why I'm so familiar with it. And I, uh, that's what I believed is that they were opening the door to try to get me to let go of the law of God so that I would be lost and condemned. And they would bring it up. Well, are you sinless? Have you stopped sinning? Right? And they were, so they're basically their mindset was, why are you telling me to do something that you're not doing? You're a hypocrite. And I was like, you, you know what? You're right. You know, if I'm going to tell you not to sin, I need to not be a sinner. So I made an effort for that and was failing. So I would come to God and be like, God, these people are going against your law. And I'm trying to get them to follow your law so that they'll be saved. But I'm not doing it myself. So if you're going to reach these people, you need to change me and you need to make me obedient to the law. You need to do something. And after years of struggling with that and praying with that, I took it as God didn't want me saved. Because I still struggled with sin. I wasn't perfect. It was a burden. The yoke wasn't easy or light. And I was just like, all right, you, you're you not going to help me. You're not going to do this. Like, I'm putting this on you. So then it really shattered things for me. And that's where I ended up. Uh, getting to the point where I am now, I had to eat a whole lot of humble pie. And uh, 
And that's how I'm able to understand this and understand walking after the flesh and being under the law is that's what I would do. And now I get what it means to walk after the spirit. Where you talk to these people about what does it mean to walk after the spirit, they can't tell you. Basically, they try to say that it's the opposite of going after the flesh. So you're not sinning. To walk after the spirit means stop sinning, which nobody's actually doing. So nobody's actually walking after the spirit. But that's not true. Right? Walking after the spirit is walking by faith. Walking by believing and trusting God, not by sight. As it says here, it, in the flesh, you can't please God. But in Hebrews 11, Paul says that the only way to please God is by faith. As Enoch is an example. And as it says here, verse 10, and if, he, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Right, The body, the flesh, which a lot of these people want to save is the body for some reason. Even though it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And we're either going to die and get a new body or we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye. So we're going to get rid of this body. Yet for some reason, they want to save it, even though it's dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we see here that the body is not saved, but the spirit, our soul is circumcised from this body. And we only have this not by anything we can see by sight but by faith, by just believing and trusting God, right? So then we come down here. Oh, well, yeah, that's another thing. you got to believe the gospel. Verse 9 here, to actually have the Spirit of God, as it says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. And that's uh, a thing I deal with a lot of these people is they're not born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. An uh, example with the Adventists, they believe that the seal of God is the Sabbath, so that they are sealed and unsealed every time they keep the Sabbath. So if they break the Sabbath one week, they're not sealed until the next week. So if they die in between that time, they're not sealed, right? But we are clearly told that the seal of God is actually the Holy Spirit in the Bible. We're not told that the Sabbath is. It says here, in verse 13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we see here that as soon as you believe the gospel, which I've been preaching throughout this whole video, you believe it in your heart. You're born again. You can't be unborn again. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You can't be unsealed. As Ephesians 4.30 tells us that we're sealed until the day of redemption. Right? So, that's when you have the Spirit of God, is when you're born again. And if you're born again, it's because you believe and trust God. You're full of faith, not because of your works. So when he's saying here, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if you have the spirit of God, well, you have the spirit of God when you believe. Believe the gospel, that is. And the same thing with these Catholics as well, is that they think that you need a man, you need the church to guide you and to teach you. And you bring up uh, 1 John chapter 2, how we received an unction, the, the the anointing, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into all truth, and that we don't need a man to teach us. And it actually says that we don't need a man to teach us. Because we can go right to God. We can prayerfully read and study the Bible. Not that we can't learn from other people, but that we don't need them to teach us. It's because they, as well, don't have the Holy Spirit. If they had the Holy Spirit, they would trust in God and realize they, they only need God. They don't need man or man's organizations. So we see both of these groups admitting to not having the Spirit of God, showing that they're in the flesh. But I want to end this video with an uplifting note here.
for the, us that believe anyway. Uh, let's start here at verse 30. It says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So you see here that those of us that he's called, because he's the firstborn of many brethren, we are also born again. We have been justified, already justified, which means we have been made righteous because we have the righteousness of God imputed to us. What shall the, we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And I love that because do you really grasp what is being said right there? If God is for us, who can be against us? And a lot of people think of like our enemies coming against us. They're going to punch us in the face or take over our country or something like that. No, no, no. This is a with condemnation here, heaven and hell. God's like, hey, I want you to be to heaven with me. I made a way for you. You can come here and walk right across this bridge. You're gonna, you can come home with me. You walk by it with your faith. By believing and trusting me, boom, you're in, right? So if God is for us, who can be against us? You really grasp that there's, there's like nothing that can stop us from coming to God and going to heaven. Nothing. He's made the way. Nothing can get in the way. Not even our flesh. A lot of these people think that, oh, we, we can lose our salvation. Well, you can't be unborn again. You can't be unsealed. So how is that? Well, because you sin. God paid for your past, present, and future sins. He imputed his righteousness on you. Nothing you can say, think, or do could ruin God's righteousness. So how the hell can you lose and ruin somebody else's righteousness? You can't. Not even your flesh that would entice you and deceive you into sin because our heart is deceptively wicked can cause us to lose this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I love this one right here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? God himself is justifying us through Jesus Christ on the cross. Who can condemn us? You could bring the law of God and say, here, God condemns you. You can be the devil's advocate. You go right ahead because the law can't condemn anybody who believes in God because he already justified us by paying for all of our penalty against it. He paid the debt, past, present, and future. It's done. So you bring forth that law. It's like, yeah, so? All those things, yeah, they condemn me, but the debt has been paid. God is for me. You not know, realize that? You can't condemn what God has justified. You're fighting against God, not me. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. You see, he's pleading on our behalf. And then, uh, I'll read this last one, because... It's a good, a good note to end on. Verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The love of Christ is that salvation, right? What he gave us on the cross. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Or you, Pharisee, Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic, denomination that's like-minded, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all thing, all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even ourselves, because we are born again children of God, and your children, when they're born into your family, they can't just walk away. You're not going to let your five-year-old leave just because he wants to leave and go do what he wants. And just because he did something stupid, you're not going to keep him out of the house and not let him in. All right, You might scold him and give him a spanking or time out or something or take away his toys or whatever it may be. 
to get through to him what he did was wrong, but you're not getting rid of him or her. Right? You love them. They're part of your family. You're, they're going to go home when you go home. Like You go out on a vacation and your child acts up and you're going to go home. You don't just leave them because they, they didn't behave. I like this analogy uh, someone uh, told me about going to a grocery store. You go to a grocery store and let's say it, everybody who's going brings their child or children. And everybody else's children are behaving. They're well behaved doing what their parents say, and everything's going smooth. But your child is just acting a fool, throwing a tantrum and crying, wanting everything, trying to run off and grab things, not listening. When you leave the store, do you leave the store with all the, the children that were obe obeying and leave yours? Or do you take your rotten child anyway and leave the others even though they were good children? You take your own. And that's how it is with God. Just because his ch child might be acting like a fool doesn't mean he forsakes them. God will never leave us or forsake us. So if he leaves us or forsake us, then that's a lie. Is God a liar? No. But a lot of these Christians want to make God out to be a liar. That something can separate you from the love of God. That you can do it. They're acting as Satan, talking to you as if somebody was coming to your child and saying, your father hates you because of what you said and done. What you said and done was wrong. He doesn't love you anymore. He's going to punish you. You're done. And he tries to separate you from that and get you to run away and go live into the world because you're hopeless. So what I talk into a lot is legalists. They'll bring up uh, Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Saying if you've willfully sin after the coming to the knowledge of Christ, there's no more sacrifice left for you, but only a fearful looking of condemnation. So they're saying, oh, everybody's condemned then, because we all have willfully sinned after the coming to the knowledge of Jesus, so we're all condemned. They completely take it out of context. The context is talking to the Hebrews, to Jews, who sacrifice animals. Like you read uh, Hebrews 10, it talks about the blood of goats and rams and what have you, and how they could never take away sin and your guilt. But Jesus Christ, his sacrifice once and for all, does this. And once you've come to the knowledge of this truth, and you willfully sin, you can't go back to sacrificing animals. There's no more sacrifice for you. Because if you go sacrificing animals, after that you've come to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus Christ is our one and only sacrifice, you are denying that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. But you see how they're acting like Satan and trying to make you think that God hates you and doesn't love his own child and that he's going to leave you and forsake you even though he said he's never going to leave you and forsake you. It's the same thing he was doing in the Garden of Eden, get, trying to get Adam and Eve to distrust the word of God and to trust his word. God said he's never going to leave you or forsake you. And for some reason you're believing Satan saying he's going to leave you and forsake you. So let's actually end with those two passages there. So that it will st still end up being a, a good note. But I'll just bring this in to prove the point. I already talked about James talking about being justified in the sight of man. So might as well bring this up. So we see here, uh, But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So he's talking to them about sacrificing of animals. Because who is he talking to? The Hebrews. Hello? You need to pay attention to who's talking and who they're talking to. An example I like to give of this is, if you hear the phrase, holy cow, what does it mean? Well, it actually depends who's saying it and who they're saying it to, right? Because if it's a Hindu saying, holy cow, he's saying that the cow is sacred. But if American is saying, holy cow, he's just saying like, whoa, right? That's crazy. So those two phrases can mean com two completely different things. It depends who is saying it and also who you're saying it to. Because something can change depending on uh, who you're talking to, right? Uh, so then he comes down here. And uh, 
Verse 10, he says, by the which will we, ah, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. He says it at verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So he's talking to them about the sacrifice of Jesus. And then he says, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where the remission of sins is, there is no more offering for sins. Right? So he's saying once you've accepted Jesus as your sacrifice, there's no more offer for sins. You don't offer up animals, that is. Right? So then he's talking about by boldness of the blood of Jesus, you enter into the holy place where they wouldn't go into the most holy place of the temple because they would die. But now that you're actually purified and sanctified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, you can actually enter in with boldness. So then, when you take that into context, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, that there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. He is not saying that you are condemned if you sin once you accept Jesus. That would contradict the rest of the scriptures. Right? Even in the Old Testament, you could sacrifice for willful sins. John in 1 John talks about if you sin, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins and the whole sins of the whole world. So he's saying if you sin, you've got an advocate. So here, he's not saying that you're condemned. The context is that if you willfully sin, you can't offer up animals again. Right? And that's why it says here at verse 29 of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he hath sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So here he's telling them if you were to offer up an animal sacrifice after Jesus Christ has died for you and is the ultimate sacrifice that all the sacrifices were pointing to, you would be rejecting God's sacrifice in the blood of the covenant that has sanctified you in the spirit of grace. Right? That's the context here. But these people, like Satan, the serpent in the garden, like to twist the word of God and put doubt into you. A doubt that you should not have. That there's no need. That just cripples you and ruins your witness in your walk with God. Let's go to this. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Did I go to the wrong verse? I think I just did. I went to the wrong one. So let's go. Should have had the E sword up. That one works a little better. Z with the two E's or oh man neither leave thee it's leave thee first right leave thee or forsake thee I just don't use the E sword with the screen capture because it uh, seems to freeze up a lot. If you notice in one of the last videos I did, it freezed up. I suppose you can look this one up. But it'd be making a god a liar to say that he would leave you or forsake you. So I guess what I'll end actually with... Did I actually leave the verse? Uh, 
that's unfortunate. Let's go to here. Let's just leave on the good note here. Who can condemn you? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So if you, struggling with your flesh, and your flesh wins and causes you to sin, and you actually wanted to, you enjoyed it, whatever the sin was, smoking a cigarette, getting drunk, looking at pornography, whatever it is, and you actually, you didn't want to do it, but the temptation came up and the urge was so strong, and you you were just like, yeah, I want to do it, and you gave in, and you enjoyed it, you're not condemned. What you did is wrong, but it's the flesh that's weak. As Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's something you need to come to God with and work with God on. You're not condemned because Jesus has died for your flesh. Past, present, and future is taken care of. You need to walk by that faith that you're not condemned. It's Satan that wants to condemn you. Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but to save it. Right? But a lot of Christians twist that. Twist it completely. So anyway, just think about this, God's view, and imputed righteousness. And just think about this last thing. Simultaneously justified and sinful. It's amazing grace right there, right? Something to sing about. Thanks for watching. Take care.